This is the third video in a series in which I'm repairing and restoring an HP 9830A desktop calculator. In the previous two videos I got as far as installing the power supply card and repairing the uh, input socket and I started to reassemble by refitting the card and I was testing a few of the voltages coming out of it and they all seemed correct if uh, a couple were a little bit high. Um, in this video I want to have a quick look at the um, power supply card. I was asked um, if I would be showing this on a video so I'll do that in this video. Um, but also something else that's uh, interesting um, but not in a good way has come to light with this machine and I thought it would be interesting at this point to just uh, cover that and what's in store for the future videos in this series. What I'll do first is explain um, how the um, power supply card works. It's very simple, so um, if power supplies aren't your thing, then um, skip to uh, uh, further into the video when I look at the, um, the mystery that unfolded when I was trying to look into this. Quite often you find that um, restoring old equipment, um, the, the restorations and repairs don't go quite as you would expect, and that's certainly the case with this one. Um, but first we'll look at the um, power supply card. I only found two components on here that needed replacing. The main one was the pass transistor for the 5 volt rail. Um, I will clean up the rest of the card uh, at some point. Um, I have started cleaning the back and um, I've cleaned the flux off. Uh, but I need to clean the rest of the, uh, the card. And this, um, I don't know if you can actually see it, but the dust in here, let's bring the light a bit closer. The dust in here is part of what caused a, a major problem with this machine. And I'll, I'll go into that in more detail in a few minutes. Um, but first to explain how this card works, it's, it's very simple. This is the schematic for it. Now I believe these schematics were reverse engineered by someone because HP didn't release the schematics for this. So um, a huge debt of thanks to whoever did this, a huge amount of work. and really nicely laid out uh, diagrams. So we got as far as uh, checking um, that the power supply overall was working, replace the input sockets, replace the pass transistor. But the way this works is very straightforward. Firstly this piece down here is just a simple uh, reset pulse generator. So as the 5 volt rail first comes up this is a one shot uh, multi vibrator and it creates a short duration negative going reset pulse that is used by the rest of the machine to reset various parts um, of the uh, processor. What we then have is a series of um, very similar looking circuit blocks. Now of course uh, we need um, some form of um, AC input to this because it is mains power of course and that's just a very basic centre tapped transformer and we have what amounts to three bridge rectifiers each of which is generating a DC voltage that is fed to various parts. Notice the diodes in this particular one are uh, reversed, so this is a, a negative voltage coming out of this part. These ICs are LM723s, so basic, although very capable, uh, voltage regulators. Very nice um, IC, it's quite old, it's been around for a very long time. And one thing that's very interesting with this, as we go through it and we start looking at the boards, it's quite a, a capable computer for its time. It was based on the design of an earlier model that was actually brought out in 1970. And to put that into perspective, if you've seen my videos on the Apollo, um, the AGC, the computer that was used in the Apollo program, and how old the technology was in that and that it was right at the beginning of development of ICs. This was designed just five years later so in five years as you go through you'll see a vast number of various types of ICs and bear in mind this was just a few years after the AGC was designed. Okay so this is um, a fairly flexible device it just allows different um, regulator circuits, positive, negative, uh, also allows for switching regulators for um, more efficient uh, designs where high power 
uh, and low heat output is required. So it's quite straightforward in the way it works. It's just got a, essentially a, a few comparators and current sources inside. You feed it a reference voltage and then it compares the reference voltage coming in to the input voltage you're feeding it, which you normally take from the regulated output, either directly or indirectly, compares the two and then decides whether to switch the output high or low. And it's the switching of the output that obviously feeds power through when it's needed or disconnects it when it's not. If it's in linear mode, then it, it uh, will essentially generate a, a linear output. Less efficient, generates uh, a lot more heat. Well, of course, if you configure it as a switching regulator, then it's uh, far more efficient. You can also have uh, negative switching or negative linear um, configurations as well. So if you look at these circuits, this is from the data sheet for the device. And if you look at the circuits, they are almost identical uh, to the reference circuits that are provided. So the first one down here is the 5 volt regulated supply. Provides quite a lot of current. There are a lot of boards, a lot of ICs in this that need 5 volts. So it produces uh, quite a few amps at 5 volts. We have a few features for protection. And one of the main things you see in this power supply, which is what kind of led me on to looking into what had caused the failure in the first place. Um, because this has so much protection built into it, it seemed odd compared to the damage I was finding on some of the boards. Uh, but as I said, I'll come to that in a few minutes. So firstly, the way this works is it's very similar to the reference in that it's got a, uh, a switching pass transistor and configured as sort of a Darlington pair, but with um, some smoothing and feedback built into the, uh, the switching. You have the um, diode that conducts when the pass transistor is off to make sure you still have a, a circuit. Otherwise, obviously, the current would stop and you'd get very, uh, a very large amount of ripple. You have a, an overcurrent protection. This also ensures that the voltage when the machine is powered up cannot rise too high too sharply because obviously when you first turn this machine on, then there's quite a lot of smoothing um, capacitance coming from the bridge rectifiers and you need to make sure that the reference voltage is held low until the input supply voltage is at a sufficient level that the circuit can actually control the 5 volt output correctly. So the way this works is there's a, a, a capacitor down here and that is used purely to keep the reference voltage low until such time as the voltage coming into the main regulator has stabilised. If the voltage is reversed, that is if this voltage here and the reference voltage are too far out of sync, I think it's something like 0.6 volts, if they're too far out then this will switch on and effectively that clamps the output to off. That will occur either if the power up is uh, not quite correct, if somebody's flicking the mains power switch on and off will cause that, or more likely if you short circuit the 5 volt rail then this will kick in and it will completely disable the, um, the regulator. You'll see these components on all the outputs and if you're familiar with repairing old TVs you'll, you'll recognise these as being crowbar protection and the way these work is the Zena and a resistor feeding the gate of a thyristor. If you're not familiar with thyristors they're a bit like transistors but once you turn them on they will not turn off until you bring the current flowing through them down to zero. So in other words it's kind of like a a self-latching um, transistor and the way this works is once the voltage on the gate of the thyristor goes above a certain level which is set by the diode, the Zener diode, it will turn on and it will stay on until power is removed from the machine. So that works in conjunction with this so once um, this is triggered it effectively short circuits the 5 volt rail, prevents it going too high, the overcurrent protection will kick in and it will disable um, this circuit and stop feeding too much power out of the device until you power cycle the machine. If there is a fault and it remains and obviously it will go straight back into that uh, shutdown mode again. The other circuits are very similar, the only difference is these are um, running in the linear mode uh, but they do have external pass transistors to handle the higher current that's required. So this is the plus 12 volt 
uh, output plus 16 which is regulated and plus 19.5 which is only partially regulated and then a completely unregulated rail and we'll look at what these are for when we start looking at the boards in the machine. We also have the negative supply going to um, this circuit and this is just the minus 12 volt uh, regulator output. What is quite interesting here is that all the reference voltages used in all the um, stages including the negative voltage regulator are fed from the 12 volt output so that's this point here. So in other words if you lose the 12 volt output then you will also lose uh, all of the other three uh, voltage outputs as well. So that's quite a, a nice feature just bear that in mind if you're repairing one of these if there's no power on any of these but you're getting power going in then check your, your 12 volts is working because otherwise it will shut down all the other power output. Now an interesting side effect of having the negative supply referenced from the plus 12 volt supply is that will mean that the minus 12 volt supply will directly mirror the plus 12 volt supply. So in other words if this changes this will change in, um, in direct response to that and it will make sure that these two are always in balance which is quite a, a nice design feature and it means it's far less likely you will damage ICs because the center point of these two voltages will always be swinging about the uh, zero volt point. So that's pretty much it. If you want me to go into this in more detail then uh, please uh, drop a comment. But this is a relatively straightforward um, circuit and as I said it's really just using um, the uh, reference circuits given in the data sheet. In the last video I said I was going to install the card and leave it running for a while and if you are familiar with restoring old equipment you'll know that they quite often have very distinct uh, aromas and this one in particular smells or initially smelled like um, 1970s 1980s uh, electronics um, equipment um, but when I was leaving it running I was getting some very unusual odors coming from the machine and this wasn't really getting very hot there's no load on it of course because none of the boards are plugged in but even so I was getting some very strange um, uh, smells coming from the machine and the first I thought it was maybe the capacitors were starting to fail um, but these weren't getting warm either and um, the voltage uh, was fine there was no excessive ripple so I started investigating the uh, motherboard and I will look at the motherboard now I'll bring the machine back onto the bench and we'll have a look at that in a bit more detail okay so I've got the chassis back on the bench I've removed the power supply and as you can see I've also removed the two guide plates from each side of the motherboard the the problem I first had with this uh, as you know was the mains switch had failed and also the input socket had failed and once I replaced those uh, or at least replaced the input socket and bypassed the main switch then I was getting reasonable voltages coming out of the power supply but I was getting some very strange smells coming up from the motherboard if I just uh, get the meter in here I'll show you what uh, I found so I'll switch this into ohms and there's nothing plugged into the motherboard at all obviously the power supply the, the rear panel's gone so the, um, the power transformer has, uh, is gone there's nothing else plugged into this at all but if I measure between for example the two pins that feed the main power into the power supply you can see that I'm getting um, some leakage between the two pins if I measure another two pins I'm getting leakage between those. If I measure two more pins, I'm getting leakage between those as well. Now these shouldn't be connected to anything at all. These just go directly back to the connector that the main transformer plugs into. And so there shouldn't be anything on here whatsoever. And some of these are quite low. Now I've got it down a bit. I've been poking around underneath the motherboard. Unfortunately you can't get the motherboard out um, without taking all the metalwork out, which is what I've been doing which is why I've taken the side cheeks out but I thought I'd just put this on the video at this point to show what I found before I go any further and one of the unfortunate things is I've discovered that some of the um, more important cards in this are quite badly damaged and while the power supply was still fitted I started poking around on some of the sockets going to the cards I found damage on 
and I was getting AC voltages appearing on some of the pins on here even though there aren't any tracks going directly from the AC to any of these. In fact the, the AC doesn't go anywhere apart or shouldn't go anywhere apart from directly to the power supply. So the fact I was getting AC on here means that there's also something going on with the motherboard. Um, now I started poking around underneath to see if I could find anything that uh, could be causing that. You, you can't really get the motherboard lifted up at all without taking everything to pieces which is quite a feat on this machine. It's very weird in the way it's been designed that it's like a, uh, an onion, you've got to kind of peel it layer by layer. Um, but as I said I thought I'd show this at uh, this point and what I found is that if you recall the fan sits in this back corner and it actually blows air in, it doesn't extract. And if you look at the earlier video you'll see there was a huge amount of dirt in this corner. I did clean it out, I vacuumed it out. Um, but as I went through the machine it became apparent there was an awful lot of dirt and debris in here and it was everywhere. It had gone into uh, every nook and cranny. I've been vacuuming this out. But everywhere I looked there was vast amounts of, uh, of debris. And what I found is that, um, as you can see I haven't cleaned it all out yet, but what I found is that there's a huge amount of dirt gone underneath the motherboard. There's about a quarter inch gap between the motherboard and the bottom of the chassis and it's been blown underneath the motherboard and all the air on the machine exits through this corner. This is the only place air can get out of the machine, so in other words it blows in to this corner. There are some vents in the end cheeks, in other words the the boards sit between these cheeks and air comes through the slots, blows down through the machines, sort of, um, blows down through the machine in this direction and then out through slots here and then out through the vent on this side. But it also does that underneath the motherboard but once it gets to this corner it can't get out because the transformer connector and the transformer itself and the wires going to the main switch are in the way. And from what I can tell by peering underneath um, the entire corner of the motherboard is just completely uh, caked up with what looks like it looks like soot out of a chimney it's this thick black brown um, uh, muck very similar to what I fished out of the connector when I pulled the um, transformer connector out so what I need to do is get the motherboard out and clean all that off and uh, hopefully that's what's causing the leakage but I suspect that's also how the voltage has got across into the uh, memory card and that's most likely what's caused the damage. I need to figure out what's caused the damage before I can start repairing anything. There's no point in me replacing expensive parts if they're just going to fail again. So I need to get this whole thing taken out and see if it is just dirt. Uh, I suspect it is because every time I poke something underneath I'm getting a kind of thick black uh, dirt coming out. And I can't even get this in unless I push quite hard and it goes through and sticks into something fairly solid. So I'm pretty sure there isn't supposed to be anything under there, but it's built up over the years. I think an important thing here is that on the rear of the machine, there was this. This um, clips into the rear corner. And while there was a mesh on the inside of this, I think the mesh is not original. I think somebody's put that in there. And what there should be, I'm fairly sure, is a gauze in here, like a filter gauze. So it's sucking air in through this and I think there's been nothing to stop dirt and dust and not getting into the machine that just blows through the machine and collects on the output side. And I think that's what's caused the, um, the main failure of this machine. So if ever you do take the um, foam filter off this be sure to replace it otherwise the machine is going to fail at some point. So as I say I'll strip it down, clean it up and then I'll uh, fit the power supply and hopefully um, all the um, weird voltages I was getting on this will have uh, gone away. Uh, if not I'll um, make another video and try and figure out what is going on. Okay I wasn't going to video this bit, it's fairly disgusting but um, I thought it may be interesting, there's so much dirt and debris. The strange thing is it's fairly damp so um, I'm assuming that's what's causing the uh, the issue but um, they really didn't want the motherboard to fall out there was an awful lot of screws holding it in place um, so what I'm going to do is 
clean all the dirt out, vacuum it out, clean the back of the motherboard off and um, see if we still have the leakage. It did appear there was some small nests of some sort, some uh, insects or something had been making a home under here so that may have been what's causing the problem but I'll, say I'll get this vacuumed out and then uh, we'll do a quick test to see if the uh, leakage is gone. If not, I'll need to start investigating the, um, the motherboard. There's only two layers, so I doubt there's any moisture got in um, amongst the inner layers. The, the, there's only the top and bottom layer. But uh, I'll get this cleaned up and then get back on camera and see if we've uh, resolved the problem. Okay, so I've cleaned the worst of the uh, debris out. Um, surprisingly, I still had a bit of leakage even after I'd lifted the board up and I couldn't find anything on the bottom that could really account for it. There was a bit of corrosion but nothing uh, at all serious. The only thing I found that I needed to fix was there was um, a poor connection between top and bottom layers on this wire so I've um, repaired that. Uh, the only way I could get rid of all the leakage completely was to clean the bottom to give it a wash. Um, just basically another tap with some detergent and then dry it off with uh, compressed air. I don't want to do that on the top because obviously there's um, some fairly deep sockets and it will be quite difficult to dry them out. So what I'm going to do here is use some uh, isopropyl alcohol, clean what I can get to and then use compressed air to clean the rest out and that will hopefully clean up the uh, rest of the, um, the dirt. I'm not quite sure what it is, I don't know if this has come out on camera or not, but there's a kind of a layer of something on the board and um, it's kind of light brown. It's, is this stuff is very hard to remove, I'm not sure what it was, so. but um, I've got a feeling that's what was causing the majority of the problem. Uh, but that's now mostly gone, I'll finish cleaning it up, give it uh, um, another good clean with uh, IPA, and then that should be it. The leakage has now gone, I can't measure any leakage on this anymore, and um, hopefully when I reassemble the chassis that will be that particular problem solved. This is most likely what caused the main issue with the board. Unfortunately, because of the way that the motherboard's laid out, or in particular the, the order the cards are in, the most susceptible cards are closest to the, um, the AC socket, so um, that could well be what caused the problem. I'll hopefully be able to go over this in a bit more detail once we start looking at the cards in turn and figuring out what the actual fault was, or what the damage is, and that will maybe give us more of a clue as to exactly um, what the um, the cause of the problem was. Um, by the way, um, I've gone as far as I can with this now, and uh, the next step is really to uh, dirt in there. And the next step is really to um, finish cleaning it, and then see if I can figure out how to reassemble the chassis. So I've still got some other bits of the chassis to clean off. Um, there's some um, various bits of debris that uh, that's left but these will be fairly easy to clean, it's just really a brush and a vacuum and then blow them off with compressed air. Once I've done that I can start reassembling it and we can then start looking at the, um, the more interesting boards. Well in the end I did have to resort to scrubbing the board under the tap. Um, I just couldn't get the brown gunk off, whatever it was, um, and I suspect that's what was causing the problem in the first place. It was um, very sticky goo type um, dust that had settled onto the board and um, I suspect it was just holding moisture and that's what was causing the tracking across the board but I just couldn't get it from underneath the sockets so I had to uh, give it a good scrub using water and detergent and then I dried the board with compressed air. As you can see it's now uh, much cleaner. I just now need to do the same with the chassis and the same problem with the chassis I just can't get this stuff off whatever it is. Um, so I cleaned the chassis and then I can get it reassembled and um, we can start looking at the more interesting boards.